Um, so thank you for coming to this. Just to um, say that that is the title, um, but because this session, session has been cut down to half an hour, we're not actually going to do that, so don't worry. It's <laughs> You've come to the right session. <laughs> um, we might just do a quick sound check with Keith. Can we do that, Martin, just to see if we're online? We're going to do all sorts of things today that might go horribly wrong, so we're going to try and bring in Keith Smythe from UHI, and hopefully he has a group of people there in UHI as well, um, because we're going to have a bit of collaboration, so you will all be working with people. So if you haven't met someone, as Kate suggested, or as Sharon suggested, you know, if you haven't spoken to someone that you don't know, um, this would be a perfect opportunity for you to do in this session. We might have to get you to squish in and, and work together as well. But I think, we're, are we working with Keith? Yeah. yeah, okay, that's great. So we will be handing over to Keith at some point as well. Um, but yeah, let me just move the, the slide here. So yeah, um, because we're going to, we've only got half an hour, this is basically what we're doing today. So I'm gonna hand over to Bill to give you a bit more of an explanation. Yes, so, 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 and I'll use that and you can put that on, make sure. Okay, uh, although there's three of us, uh, different kinds of people, backgrounds, etc. We've tried to work over the, the pitch we've been working together as a thought collective, as we call ourselves. Uh, and so, uh, in the spirit of that, uh, we, we use this little phrase here, let our numbers be unlimited, which is a kind of pastiche on the work of a group uh, from the past called the London Corresponding Society. Uh, and that was formed in 1792 in a pub by a guy called Thomas Hardy, who originated in uh, uh, Stirlingshire in Scotland and then went down to London to make his fortune uh, and he got involved with other people in looking at the hardness of the times and the need to improve the position of the ordinary working man uh, as the, the phrase was in those days. Uh, but they also had a bigger ambition and that was a very radical ambition of the time which was to get political representation for ordinary people, to get the franchise extended and uh, life being life uh, this did not go unnoticed by the authorities, and they were all had up for high treason, which uh, could have got them hung, drawn, and quartered, but they had a good lawyer and managed to get off. And it's resonated to me down the centuries, the idea of let our numbers be unlimited, which is kind of a spin on the, one of the rules of the, the, the corresponding society. They, they used letters. They sent letters to other societies in different parts of England. Uh, and in some ways, there's almost a kind of historical echo uh, of what we are trying to do with the internet uh, and so on and so forth. So that's our first thing, I guess, is that our idea of open and openness for today anyway, until we change our minds later on, uh, is the idea that the numbers of people involved should be unlimited and that perhaps there should be a radical edge to it. It shouldn't simply all be about teaching people how to be capitalists or whatever. There should be a challenge there. So that's our own generative theme, if you like, open as challenge. So just to explain what we're going to do today, um, we are going to, um, we're giving you the introduction and then we're going to do some group discussions with you. Um, this work is based on a book that um, Bill, Keith and I have recently pub published called Conceptualising the Digital University, which we'll talk a bit about later. One of the things that we have been asked by in, in that, I think that's someone else just join, joining our collaborate room as well, um, is critical pedagogy. And it was lovely to see the, the quotes from uh, Giroux in Kate's uh, session this morning because we've tried to put hope into our work. And we have been actually trying to do some of the things that Kate suggested in, in terms of reimagining and um, giving an alternative vision to how universities can develop. So we're going to try and, um, in the spirit of critical pedagogy, what we're going to try and do is have a, a digitally distributed culture circle, um, which may or may not work. So exciting times, guys, but we'll move we'll give it on. A try. OK, so some of our ideas and concepts uh, are captured on that slide. So there's a lot more in the book. But a few things to pull out. What is a university for was one of the things that we organized a lot of our ideas around and a lot of our work around. What's it actually for? Is it for the benefit of the rich and powerful? Uh, or is it actually for the benefit of the, the, the vast majority of people who, who need an education, who need to meet other people for learning purposes? So we're much influenced, obviously, by Stefan Collini, who writes very uh, cleverly and articulately about the, that question, what's a university for? Uh, and that's uh, a thing that, uh, that we focused on. And one of our poll points, and you can see it there, in, it's kind of big in blue, 
is a challenge in neoliberalism. Somebody in Dave's session threw that up, challenge the neoliberal agenda, and quite right too, because if you don't, uh, you'll end up in a precarious contract if you're not already on one. That's one of the sharp points of the, the neoliberalism world, which used to be seen as uh, academic jargon a few years ago, but I think more and more people are starting to say, well, that's that precarious employment, isn't it? So it's, that's telling students that the whole point of being a, a student and getting a degree is you can earn a better graduate salary and you really ought to use a special information system to find out which university to go to in order to get the best graduate salary later on. What that does for nurses is kind of beyond me because the <coughs> labour market for nursing doesn't really uh, operate quite the way that the theorists of neoliberal higher education would have you believe. So a couple of our values there, the uh, idea of things being discursive, reflective, dialogic. Again, I would think meat and drink to your good selves, so say a little more about that. Uh, that, I guess, tries to sum up uh, one of our key ideas, that we work with people and pedagogy and not simply technology, important as it is, and definitely as a, uh, a, a critique of managerialism, which you could say is, uh, is the sharp end of the, the neoliberal approach to higher education in universities, and it's been there growing steadily and developing its power and, and breadth and span for some decades. Now, I'm retired, but... Uh, I talk occasionally to old colleagues and I ask them what it's like now. And they say, it's pretty much the way it was when you left, only worse. And that's not a good message to be getting back from your, your colleagues. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I don't have time really to explain this in full, um, but one of the, um, I suppose, part of our work, and we've presented at OER, I think a couple of times now, certainly at OER 16, when we were just starting this work, we started with um, what we called a conceptual matrix, was basically there was four um, elements there, as a way to discuss this question of what is a university for. And we tried to look at it in a slightly different way in terms of not doing some of the things that Kate was talking about in terms of you know just having, um, I suppose, data and, and spreadsheets and things, but talking about what people actually did in a university. So we had notions of participation, of information literacy, of curriculum and course design, and of the learning environment, but the learning environment being the physical and the digital spaces that all our work takes place, place in. Um, and we've expanded this um, through the book, and again, we can't explain this in, in the limited time that we've got. But what we very much see now, um, what we would like to propose is to think about, when we're thinking about organisational development, or uh, reimagining a university or developing a university, that academic development should be at the heart of that process as well. And it should be about people, and that would be a way to engage and have the discussions and challenge some of the things that were coming through, um, particularly in Kate's inspiring talk this morning, but as a way to focus back on people and what's actually happening in the institution. Um, so we can then look at open education and open educational practice as a really, really powerful way to do that. And we've been talking about praxis and getting people to understand what that actually means. And again, using critical pe pedagogy to allow people to contextualise where they are and actually to understand their place within the university, whether you're a student or, or a staff member, and the wider political situation that we are all living in. Um, and again, what we're hoping, although we have written very much from our context, which is in the UK, we're hoping that this um, critical lens would allow people from other parts of the world um, to be able to have um, an engaged conversation as well. And then we, maybe we could have a different way of sharing our experiences, but doing that more openly as well. So we're going to bring in Keith now. So one of the, I suppose, one of the instantiations of this, this matrix is what we're calling the digitally distributed curriculum. And if Keith is there, and if we can hear Keith, Keith is maybe going to talk through this. Can we, can we get Keith? Do I have to swap over? Oh, yeah, Martin to the rescue. If Keith's not there, we'll have to talk to this diagram, so hopefully he's there. <laughs> he just tweeted that he wasn't. Oh dear. All right, we're reconnecting. <laughs> oh no. He's not there. It was all working so well. <laughs> um, I don't suppose Keith tweeted a new link. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, at least that's it. Well, at least I'll be better than that. We can. Good man. Yes, we can. Hello. Hi, Keith. Can you hear us? Yes, yeah, I can. Should we sit down? Okay, Keith. Over to you. you could you explain the digitally distributed <coughs> curriculum? I was in the carpet when the problem was like always, so I'm, uh, uh, I'm back in my support. Um, yeah, so following what you know, Sheila and Bill were saying, um, it depends on how you try to instantiate some of the thinking. And it changed with some of the previous sessions all about David White. Um, we very much looking at um, values around uh, reciprocity and uh, praxis. Yeah, yeah, we can still hear you. Okay, sorry, um, uh, there seems to be a bit of a connection problem. Um, so, um, in terms of how you can start with some of this in relation to uh, this concept of the digital distributed curriculum, we're kind of really looking at the notion of the digital um, and digital space as a way to expand and extend higher education and our universities are a public good um, and to co-locate both the universities and the curriculum and learning and the outcomes of learning within the wider community as well. So, um, so in relation to the digitally distributed curriculum, we've conceptualised this as involving um, three distinct um, elements, if you like. Um, one of the values that we think underpin uh, working in this way, and this type of open uh, reciprocal practice and co-location for university. So values are really around praxis, um, challenging changing things within our societies and communities need to be challenged and changed. Uh, public pedagogy, as a means of thinking about the location and co-location of learning beyond the, the, the walls and silos of the institution itself. And then participation, which is really kind of um, something that flows across uh, the, the rest of how we, we conceptualise and digitally distribute the curriculum. From values, we move into enabling dimensions. Um, these enabling dimensions um, are dimensions of practice, if you like, um, that allow us to take those values and turn them into something tangible. Um, so, the dimensions of enabling dimensions that we identify include open scholarship, co-production, philosophy, and co-location, um, both of spaces, um, both of formal and informal learning communities, uh, and also the co-location of the university um, within and alongside and through public web spaces. And something that's very important to us when we really conceptualize this um, is to um, not, not try to not fall into trap of um, creating open with just open online. Um, so you see in relation to philosophy, um, we're talking about open online engagement, uh, open campus engagement, and also open in the community. A third element to the individual distributed curriculum is around how it's instantiated and how it's enacted. Um, so these are really um, the practical uh, um, things in terms of our practice, um, curriculum design, um, how we capture outcomes of value, and how we them. So without going into all this in detail, uh, and this co-production of co-creation and agency, creation, creation, and this is the same with how practice um, in terms of open scholarship. We're talking about coursework and, and knowledge is produced in digital artifacts and digital that involves public projects. Uh, and two digital digital scholarship which to scholars and contribute to public projects. And then in relation to co-location, which we've talked about, um, the meaning but also how we will self-select the dual spaces. And as I mentioned, about that whole access to intercept with the three farm spaces, the dual spaces, and the level of other spaces that are achieved. Great, thanks, Keith. So um, hopefully you got that. Um, but what we would like you to do now, we do have, I tweeted out a link to a Padlet wall. Um, and what we'd like you to do is thinking about these, um, I'll go back to that, that's the, the URL, but I tweeted it out and we can get that from this. Oh, I'm in the wrong one. Um, hopefully, what we'd like you to do is look at these, um, the, the enabling dimensions of open scholarship, co-location, porosity, and uh, co-location. 
And we'd like you to, in groups, maybe think about how your work actually, or if your work uh, includes any of that. And so we've put some suggestions of, of enabling factors, but maybe if you have um, any instantiations of that, you could um, share that as well. Sorry, I'll just get that slide up properly. Why is it you can never use one of these keyboard like trackpad mice when you're presenting something? But basically, we want you to look at the. Um, oh, it's not working at all. I'm going to get technical fail here um, with this. But we'd like you and your groups to actually look at that based on that diagram have a conversation about these um, values and see if they would work in your context. I don't feel so bad because Martin Hoxie's mm -hmm. had to plug in a mouse, so I don't feel like a failure now. It's over here. So that, that's the, the padlet wall. I'll give people a, a maybe look at that and get that. We'll go back to that, but possibly more important to look at that diagram. So looking at open scholarship, co-location, porosity, and co-production, you might just want to take one of those elements. In the diagram, we've got some um, instantiations and, and some suggestions of things that we think kind of are examples of practice in, in that area. But we'd be really interested to see if, if you think that you, you know, that's part of your practice, if you do something else in these areas. And also, I think, from different um, parts of the world, and, you know, how can we actually have more porosity between you know, different cultures and, and different countries? Um, and thinking about some of the, the issues of privilege and ownership and control, how can we, we do that? And thinking about notions of third spaces, so how we in education work with different um, parts of society as well. So it might be a bit complicated. It might not work. But we just want you to share what, what you what you do. So I'll go back to the Padlet link, but we'll, we'll put this back up um, as well, so you can keep that in mind. If you have any questions, of course, do ask us. But please, we just want you to have a discussion um, as much as you can um, about that, and then we'll we'll watch the Padlet wall grow as you as, as you add. Well, I'm happy that you've got the link. You're okay with oh, that. Okay. Ready to go. Okay. Okay. Um, just shove it back to the yeah. main slide. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Over sense? to you. Hi. We'll give you a shout about five minutes from the end and uh, perhaps have some live discussion as well. Just okay. to, I'll, I'll help you with the time. Thank you. Off you go. Right, folks, time is, is always against us. So we're going to bring up the Padlets and see what you did. Right, can we get you to focus a wee bit for uh, just a few minutes? We've got about five, five minutes or so less. I think no, it doesn't look, it doesn't look like it. There's, 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 it's great to see everything coming through on the Padlet wall, and, and we will share this, and we are going to follow up on this. But um, I don't know. Is there anyone? I'm good. good uh, is, is there anyone that would like to make a comment about anything just now, or um, how useful you find it? It seemed to certainly generate quite a lot of discussion in the room. You might just have been talking about other things, though. I don't know. Hopefully, you were talking about about this. But um, I think that's kind of validating what we were doing. I think it's interesting seeing things coming in about working with students. And I think that's absolutely uh, critical and crucial how we do that. And Scott and I were just having a discussion about the confidence it takes to be an op open practitioner within your institution. Um, and we, again, we were just talking about privilege. And I probably am in a position where I have got the privilege of just saying, just be open because I've been able to um, develop my own open practice over many years. Um, and at some points, I, you know, I kind of think, well, I'm just going to do it anyway. I have a great phrase from a, a colleague who says, proceed until apprehended. And in dark times, you actually have to do that. Sometimes you just have to do things and see how it goes. But instilling that confidence 
um, to other colleagues and actually being able to have a discussion so people can actually not feel scared about doing something but actually feel liberated by making a resource op uh, open. And as Kate pointed out, you know, to create something, you, you do need support to do that. But we have to find creative ways and understand our own practice to be able to do that. And we need to be able to support staff and students to be able to do that. I think we miss out a, a huge amount in terms of what our students can do, particularly around uh, co-production and co-location. And I think notions of expanding what a university is, is, is for. And again, fighting back against that, against that kind of spreadsheet numbers the students are just the data the students are people the students are our future you know so we really want them to be creating and sharing as much as we can well, that's great. quick thing one of the kind of key words for us was porosity and uh, part of the reason for that was a couple of years back at uh, the university of highlands and islands in inverness we had a couple of days on the idea of the porous university and it got a lot of discussion going and for me anyway it, it seemed to be a helpful word for uh, destabilizing and unfreezing uh, often quite tightly structured notions of what are the boundaries, what are the, the openings so that people can get in. Uh, and it's obviously much easier from a corporate management point of view to restrict uh, porosity, I would say, uh, and try to keep everything on the basis of somebody signed a form that says they want to come here uh, or some such thing. So I think, just throw it out to you, there's obviously stuff coming up there, and it's good, the uh, idea of the wider public. And if you think back to the example we gave of Thomas Hardy and his buddies in the pub, uh, that's actually, f from our experience, very close to uh, concepts like the Ragged University that's uh, on the go in Scotland, and we work, uh, I hope to do more work with uh, uh, the folk involved with that. Uh, and that was just ordinary guys sitting about the pub, something that was important to them, which was getting political recognition, uh, and things went from there. Uh, so that idea of porosity, I think, is one we'd, we'd throw out into the ether uh, and, and perhaps see if people have other ideas about it later on. Yeah. And I think, again, <clears throat> you know, cultural porosity, what does that actually mean between different countries, between the languages that we use? between the cultural values that we share, the assumptions that we make about the resources that we share, where we share them, um, expectations of how people can access them as well. I think we need to have more conversations about that. And we need to be enabling our staff and students to have the space to have these conversations as well. If anyone wants to, any, any, any comments, any comments the from to... the last couple of minutes? Well, we will follow up. There's a oh, sorry. lady up there. Just a, just a small point, thinking of how uh, many of us are working undercover, if you like. You know, mm -hmm. how do we... Dick Le Bergen said this when restructuring uh, reared its head in arts and humanities, 2009-10. How do you work within the institution, which feeds us and uh, mm -hmm. some of us reach over our head. But the students are in the same position. Many of them are interested in this. Many of my students talk about this. However, they're paying for a brand they're working nights, some of them, to, to pay for that. Some are privileged, but many are mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. And so they're in that catch-22 of they can't damage what they're paying for in the hope there may be some employment afterwards. Yeah, so. absolutely. But I think, um, I think certainly very positive experiences I hear from students is when they can do something that then they can take out outside the institution and a lot of the work that we get our students to do it, there's a you know like the holes in our BLE walls it's it's bounded it's hidden so they can't take it with them so they can't use that experience as you know to help their employability chances as well and again I think it goes back to confidence of staff being being able to 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 design curriculum and design assi assignments and activities that allow students that, that those opportunities as well. And I think sometimes, yes, there is that fear because we, we do think, or, you know, actually, it's not fear, it's time. We just don't have enough time, really. To, we don't think about what we're doing in curriculum design, activity design, uh, as much as we should because we don't have the time because everyone's teaching loads are becoming heavier and heavier. We don't take enough time institutionally to say, you know what, every year we are going to have a review of our modules or our courses, whatever you might call them. Um, and we're going to look at that and see what's working. And actually, let's try things. So I think that there's a whole combination of things there. But I think that um, 
yeah, we need to be able to have a way to start having the conversations about how we can do that. We might not do it with everything, but we can do something. Good job. So. Okay, I think you had your hand up. Just Scott Connor from the University of the Highlands and Islands, just to pick up on the same point in our own institution, uh, a couple of things that restrict us. One is policies, and the policies tend to be quite restrictive, and because the policies are restrictive, we know that there's good practice going on in the institution, but the problem arises if you say you're doing a certain kind of practice that goes against a policy, you risk your practice being removed. So. In effect, it's stifling innovation in the institution just by having the policies and being too strict on the policies. I think that's, sorry, Bill, but I think academic development units can play quite a, a central role there because they are, well, quite often involved in policy development as well. So actually, maybe starting from that can help. Won't all the time, I know, but. A quick, very, very quick uh, response to both those points. If you're thinking about students, one thing that always helps me is to ask yourself and ask them, where do they get their ideas about beliefs from and so forth? And then just have that conversation. Do you get your ideas entirely from careers, masters and mistresses at school or from the careers unit at the university or whatever? Where is the space for people to think for themselves uh, and get that going? And I think if that could be instantiated, uh, a word I learned from Keith, uh, if that could be instantiated in, in practice, then you might start finding students uh, had all sorts of ideas. We all know that the climate change uh, is a big issue. A few weeks ago around the world, thousands and thousands and thousands of school kids just went out and we saw a good example. Uh, you know, if you want me to stop being an activist, stop being a shite. I think was what the Australian 12-year-olds were saying. So do think about that. When we talk about students as people and humans, we mean it. Uh, and humans and people are distinguished uh, from each other and from the stones and the trees and so forth, because they have to think. So, cognitive. Science. Okay, we're going to have to uh, call a stop there. I know some of you may be going on to the next presentation. So, thank you to Sheila and Bill and Keith online. So, thank you all. round of applause.